So, a beautiful morning. We have with us uh, Tim Baker. Uh, Tim has the uh, dubious pleasure of being the last preacher here before lockdown in March 2020. <laughs> so we're just joking in the vestry about we'll see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> so, so on your behalf, I welcome Tim and wish him God's blessing on his service this morning. Thank you. Here we are, Lord. Come amongst us as we sing, we pray, we listen, we read and reflect. Come amongst us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, good morning, Sandal. It's really, really good to be back. Um, It's really nice to be here in person. It's nice to be able to worship together. That's something we don't take for granted anymore, isn't it? Um, And and it's a real privilege to uh, be back on this glorious sunny Sunday morning as we we worship God together on this Christ the King Sunday. Um, Yeah, as Ian was saying, I realised just as we were starting um, the awesome service this morning, that 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 was the last time I'd stood in this building, uh, was on the 15th of March, when we were all just beginning to learn are we not supposed to shake hands? Can we shake hands? Should we? What, what do we do about that? We hadn't heard of face masks. We weren't sure uh, whether coronavirus was something that was going to change our lives for a day, a week, a month, or as it turned out, the best part of two years. It's been a strange two years, hasn't it? And we all carry some of the strain and the, the weight of those two years with us. But we come to worship nonetheless, and we give thanks for that. And so let's uh, have a time of worship now as we sing together number 177 in Seeing the Faith, uh, or the words will be up on the screen. Lo, he comes with clouds descending.
seat. Everlasting God, come down indeed. Let us pray. Holy God, we are gathered once again on this Lord's Day. And as we come to you this morning, we bring our whole selves in worship. We bring our whole selves to be present to you, to be open to the promptings of your spirit, to be aware of the invitation you're placing on our hearts, to be thankful for the forgiveness for all the times that we have fallen short. And to be hopeful for your plan for us and for your world. And so we come in worship. Come amongst us, Lord Jesus. We give thanks today for all the many blessings we have received. We recognise that we take so much for granted. And we take a moment this morning just to thank the Lord for the blessings that we call ours. We thank you, God, for this new day. We thank you for friends and family. We thank you for relative safety. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together in your name. And we come to knowing that there are times when we have fallen short, Lord God when we have not done the good we wish we had done, and we have done the things we really wish we hadn't. And so, Lord, we come and say sorry. But even as we think of those moments and those things that we regret, we know that you already forgive and accept us, just as we are. And for that, we are truly thankful. So we come, joyful and in tears, energised and exhausted, broken and made whole, uncertain and yet so clear. We come, we come, we come, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, the one we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Had the real privilege this morning of getting to share with the um, awesome congregation that meets uh, just before uh, you all at, uh, at 9.30 uh, this morning. And it was really good to be able to share with them and with some uh, of the, the families in and around uh, this area about this really important theme of Christ the King. So that's the Sunday that we, that we have uh, this um, This Sunday is always marked out. The Sunday before uh, Advent starts next week. It's the preparation before the season of preparation. We call it Christ the King Sunday. I wonder what you think of, of kings and kingdoms. I think Christ the King Sunday is really helpful, partly because it helps us uh, sort of counterpoint Advent and the Christmas story with this Uh, understanding that we have that Jesus is somehow Lord of all, that Christ is both the lowly child born to the peasant family in the manger and also the king of the universe and also part of the Godhead, the creator of all. It's a really uh, strong kind of counterpoint, isn't it, that we have Christ the King Sunday when we celebrate all that is kingly about Jesus 
this Sunday. And then we head straight into the, the Advent and the Christmas narratives where we recognise the loneliness, the lowliness of the, uh, the Christ child. But I have to confess, with all of that said, that I do struggle a bit with the image of Christ the King. I don't know. I think it's probably because uh, I did some history as uh, a young man and the whole history of kings in this, on this earth is not a particularly helpful one. We have some terrible models for leadership, don't we, across the course of human history. Some people who called themselves king and yet uh, were about as far from the Jesus we follow as we could imagine. People who used that position for uh, their own power, for their own strength, to destroy their enemies, to build themselves up, to make themselves wealthy, to make their, uh, their, them and their, their cronies wealthy whilst others went hungry. Lots of the kings and leaders we read about in history and perhaps even get to experience today, but who am I to comment? We not, are not people we want to emulate, not people whose moral uh, judgment we trust. There's a, a Christian drama group called Apple Cart, who uh, I once had the privilege of getting to uh, go to a theatre in London and watch them retail the whole of Mark's Gospel uh, in about four hours solid. They did four hours of, of straight drama and retold all those stories of, from Mark's Gospel. And, and they, in so doing, they're constantly sort of retranslating the scripture and trying to make it make sense for uh, the, the 21st century. And their translation of kingdom, whenever Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, they translate it as realm, the realm of heaven. They take out this word king because I guess they too are uncomfortable with this idea of kingship. And perhaps uh, some of you have also come across the idea of kingdom. Some people take the G out of kingdom so that it becomes the kingdom of heaven, a place where we are all kin, we are family, where the, the family nature of, uh, of Jesus' uh, followers and those of us seeking to be Christians uh, is what's emphasised, the kinness of it. And, and I do find those helpful, but they still miss something, don't they? There is still something kingly about Jesus. Jesus is not um, some sort of democratically elected leader who has to think about uh, in five years' time whether he's going to get, uh, win the next majority vote. Uh, nor is he someone who uh, we've kind of clubbed together and decided he should be our chief. We didn't pick Jesus as our chief or somebody doing a term of office. We're following him because we believe he is part of the Godhead, because we believe that the the tiny miraculous baby that was born in the Christmas story was somehow an incarnation of the divine. That there is something special about Jesus. So yes, we struggle with the language. Yes, we could debate. Uh, and I hope some of you will uh, raise questions and challenges over coffee uh, later about whether you find kingdom and kings helpful or unhelpful. I really want to hear your thoughts on all of that. But we still hold on to the, the power of Jesus. And that's what we remember today. Before we go into the Christmas story, we hold on to a memory, to a, 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 an important part of the Jesus narrative. That is, Christ is our King. We are seeking to follow him. And one of my uh, kind of favourite images that has kept coming uh, back to me in my Christian journey is from uh, C.S. Lewis's novels, the Narnia novels. Um, if you've never read them, then you should take a week off and read them. Um, the, uh, the very last one is called The Last Battle. And in that, there's this image of what heaven might be like. And essentially, heaven is a little bit like a, a, made, uh, a made perfect version of the world that the people have already been living in. But throughout, as soon as they find themselves in heaven, the, the characters in the story are constantly being invited to come further up, come further in. And I think that's the invitation that's there for all of us in all of our Christian journeying and traveling and seeking to discover more of, of God's nature and Christ as king is this constant invitation Come further up, come further in. So this Advent season, as you journey with the Jesus story again, 
as you hear again the greatest story uh, ever told, and you sing again the carols, and you hear again John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Don't let it just wash over you. Come further up. Come further in. Let's sing. We're number 185. Sing we the King who is coming to reign. <laughs> Chapter 18, beginning at verse 33. Pilate, went, Pilate then went back into his headquarters and summoned Jesus. So you are the king of the Jews, he said. Jesus replied, is that your own question or have others suggested it to you? Am I a Jew, said Pilate? Your own nation and their chief priests have brought you before me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom does not belong to this world. 
If it did, my followers will be fighting to save me from the clutches of the Jews. My kingdom belongs elsewhere. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, King is your word. My task is to bear witness to the truth. For this I was born. For this I came into the world. And all who are not deaf to the truth, listen to my voice. Amen. The second reading is from Revelation chapter 1, and I'm starting at verse 4b. Grace be to you and peace from him who was, who was, who is, and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins with his blood, who has made us of a royal house to serve as the priests of his God and Father. To him be glory and domination forever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Everyone shall see him, including those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the world shall lament in remorse. So it shall be. Amen. I am the Alpha, Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is, who was, and who is to come, the Sovereign Lord of all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Mary and Ian. Before we explore a little bit about uh, a little bit more about what Christ the King Sunday and what those two readings might have to say about that. Let's sing again. Uh, we're going to sing number 333, Majesty, Worship His Majesty, and let's sing it through twice.
and let's take a seat. I have a absolutely wonderful three-year-old daughter uh, at home. She's called Martha. Um, she's a great delight and my pride and joy. She's also absolutely exhausting. Uh, just at the moment, she's got that relentless uh, three-year-old spirit that uh, seems to know no tiring uh, and have ceaseless questions, such uh, to, to the extent that um, when my wife saw how many Sundays in November I'd offered uh, to come and preach on the plan, uh, she said, are you sure you're not doing that just to get away from us? Um, definitely, definitely not. Um, and, and she's absolutely uh, brilliant. One of her favourite stories at the moment is The Hungry Caterpillar. It's an absolute classic uh, of the genre, uh, and my wife invol is involved in, in children's literature, so she introduced uh, books to our family home uh, very early on, and uh, Martha was um, encouraged to start reading aged about three hours, I think. Um, but, uh, but aged three, she's fully embraced it um, and loves learning the stories. She listens so carefully when mummy and daddy or grandparents are reading the stories so that she can pretend that she can read it back. So she knows a lot of the words on the page just by remembering them and then she'll start to tell you it back. So if you say The Hungry Caterpillar, Martha starts telling you the story of The Hungry Caterpillar. Those of you who uh, don't know it, it's the story of a little caterpillar that eats uh, something each day uh, and starts to get a little bit bigger and then one day eats a huge amount of food and then the next day retreats into its chrysalis and uh, a couple of weeks later emerges as a butterfly. Wonderful uh, little story for young minds, but also perhaps a story for us to reflect on a bit this morning. Because uh, I learned something just quite recently, just in the last couple of months, about uh, the, the science that's going on uh, there in, in, the, in the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. Because caterpillars, they have a fairly boring, sort of dull life, don't they? They, often, they can't travel very far. They, it would take them uh, a, a most part of a week to cross this church. Um, they can't kind of uh, experience many new experiences. They probably shouldn't eat all the things that the hungry caterpillar eats in the story. Um, they're very vulnerable. You know, when you're a caterpillar, you're never quite sure when at your next moment a bird is about to strike from above. And in their fragile, dull, vulnerable lives, they hold within them what are called imaginal cells or imaginal cells. It seems to depend which side of the Atlantic you're on. Let's go with imaginal. Imaginal cells which hold within them the exact blueprint of what that caterpillar will look like when it becomes a butterfly. So even while it's living its dull, fragile, vulnerable life, it holds within it an imprint of what butterfly self might look like, what it might look like with wings when it's completed and perfected and set free and can set, uh, uh, fly off into the sunset. Perhaps that could be an image for us this morning, that even as we live our fragile, sometimes dull, day-to-day -day lives, we hold within us an imprint of what we'll look like in heaven. We carry a little bit of heaven with us as we go through our day-to-day -day caterpillar kind of lives. I find that a beautiful and exciting and encouraging image because I'm excited about heaven. I'm excited about what it'll look like when Tim is finally made complete and shed of all the bits of Tim that he doesn't really like very much, and I can be my heaven self. I'm excited about heaven, where there'll be no more injustice, there'll be no more poverty, there'll be no more abuse, there'll be no more coronavirus, there'll be no more lockdown restrictions, there'll be no more grief. I'm excited about that. But I'm also really excited and encouraged today to know that I'm carrying a little imprint of that already. That that's not just about waiting for some future time that I have to stretch my imagination to even begin to think about. That I'm also carrying some of that right now. I've got my own imaginal cell for what heaven might look like and what Tim might look like in heaven. And that's with me today. So yes, 
we love Revelation and the images it conjures for us of a time when there'll be no more grief and no more tears. When we learn about the God who was and is and is to come. And I wonder if sometimes we get a bit distracted by the last bit of that, that is to come. Because we get excited about heaven. We hope for a better kind of world. But we have to live here too. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus would say. Um, I grew up in the South Caribbean. My parents served the church for eight years uh, overseas all, through all my primary school years. So the ages four to 11, um, I spent uh, living in the South Caribbean. It's not a bad place to grow up if you're looking for somewhere to grow up. Um, but the, the, one of the songs we used to sing in church, and it seems to my uh, adult brain thinking back to those days that we sang it nearly every week, is, is a, a little spiritual chorus where the chorus went, and we'll have a little heaven down here. Each verse was a little bit different. It was like, I'll be kind to you and you'll be kind to me and we'll have a little heaven down here. And something of that refrain has echoed through my whole Christian journey and we'll have a little heaven down here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not just about waiting for the end. And Jesus, the king, we hear grappling with that a little bit, don't we? in uh, that John passage that, uh, that Ian read for us. Jesus the King, wondering how he can relate what he knows about kings and kingdoms to this Roman governor who's obsessed with power and who's worried about, his own, uh, uh, about the Jews turning against him and about losing his own power. How can I explain to you what kind of king I am? I'm not of this world. I'm not a king like you. Pilate. Jesus' kingdom is in and around the world, but not of it. It doesn't look like the kind of kingdom we're used to. The Jesus kingdom changes everything. And I think that's what we're invited into each day, is to wake up, to look around us, and to see where am I seeing the kingdom of heaven at work? Where is the imaginal cell of heaven within me calling out to the heaven that I see all around me? Where is the kingdom of heaven at work here today? How can I get involved with what God is already doing in Sandal this week? How can I get involved in what God's doing in my family, in the people I'll meet, in the post office queue, in the places where I am known and where I go? How can we listen out for the kingdom of heaven, which isn't just absent and distant and future and something we wait for. It's here and now and ready and waiting. Or as the poet R.S. Thomas puts it, you are a fast God, always before us and leaving just as we arrive. Can we try and keep up with God this week? Are we looking for the goodness of God in the land of the living, in the midst of the hopelessness, the despair, the pain, the isolation, the grief, the boredom, meaningless stress, frustration, cancer, mental ill health, racism, violence, abuse, sexism, relationship breakdown, miscarriage, redundancy, famine, and suicide. In the midst of all the things that weigh heavily on our shoulders, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. We just have to grasp it, to see it, to look for it, to turn aside and not get distracted by the things of this world for just a moment to see it. So I'm with the psalmist in Psalm 27, verse 14, one of my favourite passages in the Bible, uh, certainly in the top 600. Um, the, the, the psalmist writes, I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's the kind of confidence I want. That's the kind of confidence I want to wake up with each day. Not, I remain confident of this, that I am waiting for your goodness to be revealed to me in some future world, God. But I remain confident of this, that I will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. Right here, right now. 
I get the privilege of seeing that daily in my work at All We Can. As many of you know, I work for uh, the Methodist Church's International Development Charity. That means we work all around the world uh, helping people to fulfil their own potential, helping people living in, in poverty and in, in poverty-stricken areas of the world to t take down the barriers that are holding them back. We get to see each day new stories arrive in my uh, inbox of people whose lives are being changed, people whose lives are being changed by the Methodist Church in Great Britain. And sometimes for us on a day-to-day, -day, it can be hard to remember that. It can be hard to own that story. But I have the huge privilege of being reminded daily that yes, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, we are doing some good in the world and even as we gather in worship today, that work goes on. Even as you and I sit down for our lunch or make plans for whatever's got to go in the oven later, people around the world are continuing to do that work. My friends Patience and Ananiah are digging boreholes in Zimbabwe. My friends Joy and Najiba are building bikes in Uganda. Charles is putting up solar panels in Malawi. Sarah is working with teenage mums. Manjalata is coordinating support groups for women. And we are, by virtue of being part of the Methodist family, which you are this morning, because you're gathered at Sandal Methodist Church, we're part of that story too. Part of the kingdom of heaven being here and now. So in the midst of your life this week, in the midst of whatever you're doing, however caterpillar-ish you might feel this week, know that you are carrying the imprint of the divine. Know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in you, with you, and through you. Perhaps today and this week, you just need to sit with that. Perhaps you just need to let that wash over you time and time again. Perhaps you just need to recharge the spiritual batteries because you're drained and exhausting and it's been an exhausting couple of years. Or perhaps, at some point, you'll get a prompting that you're supposed to do something with it. That the kingdom of heaven doesn't just sit still forever. The kingdom of heaven is inviting you to come and take part in the making of it. And in so doing, we might discover more of Christ in our own nature. Let's go out and be caterpillar people who bear an image of God's butterfly in Jesus' name. Let's sing as a way of reflecting on all of that and listening to God's call on our lives. It's number 673. Will you come and follow me? if I but call your name.
And so let's pray our prayers of intercession. And you've already heard plenty of my voice, so I'll also just offer some space in these prayers for us to bring whatever's on our own hearts to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have come to worship you. We have come as your people. And we have come as part of a world in need. And we come bringing needs to our worship today. So, Lord God, we begin by bringing prayers for those close to us. And I invite each of you just for a moment, just in the quiet, just to hold in your mind, hold in your head the face or the name of somebody close to you who you want to pray for this morning. Perhaps somebody in your own family, a close friend, perhaps part of this Sandal Methodist community who we just want to hold in prayer today. Lord, you know each and every one of these names and faces that we hold dear. You know their stories more deeply and more richly than we know them ourselves. And you know the pain that we carry to you in prayer today. Come, comforting God. Come, healing God. Come, God of hope. God of light in the darkness. Come into each and every one of those situations. Come by your grace. Secondly, I invite you to do something similar, but with perhaps a situation or a person further afield. Perhaps a story that's come to you from afar, but you hold in your heart. Perhaps something you've read about or seen in the news, a situation, a person, a country, a place, a name. In the stillness, just hold that word, that situation in prayer. Lord, we grieve when we switch on a news channel or we open a newspaper or we flick through a news app on our phones. We grieve for a world in which there is so much pain, so much injustice, where wars continue, where vaccines reach only those who can afford them, where all is not as you would have it be. And so, Lord God, in each of those situations that we've brought in prayer this morning, we ask your spirit to be at work. Show us what is ours to do in the response to injustice in your world. 
and show us how to pray in the face of much pain. Come, Lord Jesus. Finally, I just invite you to pray for yourself and for this community here in Sandal Methodist Church, this church community, that we might discover what it is that is ours to do. Just pray for, what, that for, your, for answers to your prayers this morning in the quiet. Lord God, we are your church and you call us to live out your message, your truth, your love here on earth. You call us to be your hands and feet. And so we pray for each and every one of us here in this room, here in this church community, here in this whole community of Sandal and Agbrig and Wakefield. We pray the unspoken prayers of people who don't even know they're praying this morning. And pray that you will show us how we can be an answer to prayer this week. Guide our living. Bless our hearts. Show us how to love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's close our act of worship by singing again. We're going to sing number 661. Give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain.
into this week and go bearing the imprint of Christ the King in your hearts. Go and spread that imprint and search for the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.